It's the late Triassic, and many of the bizarre reptiles that have held dominion over Pangaea for so many millions of years have turned their scaly heads towards these new kids on the block. They're fast, they've adapted a crazy new hip innovation in which they hold their legs underneath them, and most of all, they're getting very big, very quickly. So all other animals are now asking the question, where did they come from? I want to ask you guys a question. Had I not planted a certain group in your head with the title of this video, what's the first dinosaur that comes to mind for you? We all have our favourites for sure, but can anyone objectively say that one is more important than any others? Well, I'd say yes. Now I might tick some people off by saying this, but sauropods aren't necessarily my favourite group, but I do think that they're the most important. Ecologically, evolutionarily, and for the study of the science itself. Here's why. Before my small hiatus, I made a video about how a two million year long rainstorm was one of the biggest factors in giving us dinosaurs, which you can check out here. But I didn't mention quite as much the specific dinosaurs that took initial and direct advantage of this. The experimental reptiles of the Triassic were suddenly in race mode to see who would be the first to reach the now high growing plants. And the one group that had the biggest advantage were the dinosaurs. With those pillar legs held underneath them, they had the best ability for such an endeavor. All they had to do now was get big, which would have been pretty easy to do with the competition being removed by the changing environment. Throw in a neck that gets just a little bit longer with each generation, and the pro sauropods and other sauropodomorphs had their recipe for success. Along with this, it's thought that an increase in temperature also played a big role for the growth of this group. And this is where we see their first big impact on the rest of Dinosauria. When a potential prey item evolves to become bigger, certain other predators are compelled to also grow in size, and the leading theory is that it was the initial growth of sauropods that eventually drove theropods to also reach large sizes in order to be able to take on these goliaths. Along with this, their intense amount of feeding would have literally changed the environment around them, meaning that no matter your size or dietary requirements, you'd have had to have kept on your toes in how you're evolving as a species and constantly adapt. So sauropods were clearly important in the initial leap in success for dinosaurs as a whole, but if we jump forward in time, we see that their role continued to have significant influence in their respective ecosystems. Exhibit A, the Morrison Formation. For those that may not know, the Morrison Formation is a rock formation that showcases a late Jurassic ecosystem in North America and is well known for giving us some of the most famous dinosaurs such as Allosaurus, Stegosaurus and many, many sauropods from Brachiosaurus to Diplodocus to Apatosaurus. These are some of the more famous sauropod names to come out of here but this formation is particularly standout for being dominated by various species of this group. Not all of which necessarily lived at the exact same time as each other, but they certainly made up the majority of dinosaurs here across the few million years that this ecosystem was being deposited. This sheer number of varying herds and migrations would have greatly altered the habits of other groups. For example, the alternating patterns of low grazers and high browsers would have meant that other herbivores would have had to work around them. But it also meant that diversity amongst the other herbivores had a chance to increase, since competition was lowered by the fact that many sauropods mainly fed on vegetation that others couldn't reach anyway. The predators here would have also been pushed to diversify and specialise, be it either to aim for specific herbivores in avoidance of sauropods, or maybe even evolving to be able to take on a sauropod itself. One common example of this is with Allosaurus and its fellow Morrison theropods of similar sizes. It's possible that they were able to coexist thanks to Allosaurus being more able to take on certain sauropods, as shown by isotopic studies, whereas the likes of Ceratosaurus and Torvosaurus appear to have had a body plan more suited for hunting smaller animals in thicker forested areas where the sauropods couldn't really fit. Other theropods from various formations across the Mesozoic also seem to showcase this, with behemoths such as Tyrannotitan, Mapusaurus, Acrocanthosaurus and a few others that I've talked about before showcasing impressive sizes and specialised behaviours to take on the giant sauropods of their respective regions. Now granted, the heyday of sauropods was during the Jurassic, with many being replaced by other groups that finally got big enough, so by the late Cretaceous, sauropods were relatively rare globally, but I would still argue that the late Cretaceous fauna wouldn't have gone to where they got without being pushed to that point by their sauropod influence before them, be it directly or indirectly. Now sure, the non-avian dinosaur reign came to an end and we haven't had any sauropods since the Cenozoic. But that doesn't mean that their importance doesn't play a role with us today, namely in the progression of cultures and the science of paleontology itself. The bones of sauropods have likely been known for thousands of years, 
even if those people didn't know what they were looking at, instead creating legends of mythical creatures that left these remains behind, possibly even contributing to the legend of dragons in both the East and the West. By the late 19th century, however, it was finally known that these were strange, giant, long-necked reptiles belonging to Dinosauria, and such a dramatic and alien image captured the world's imagination. Sauropods very quickly settled themselves into pop culture from there, whilst their study pushed forward our understanding of dinosaurs and the Mesozoic worlds. This group has redefined how we understand simple size in animals for a start, with ways of working around such sheer mass being discovered. One of those ways also contributed to the cementing of the relationship between non-avian dinosaurs and birds. Ever heard of the old wives' tale that Stegosaurus had two brains? One in the head and one in the hips? Well, it didn't, but the cavity that was noted in the pelvis that was sort of stored a second brain, or at the very least some sort of neural network, was found to have stored something else when a whole network of these cavities were found in sauropods. It was eventually discovered that these were in fact used to store an air sac system, which is essentially a series of mini lungs connected to the big main pair, forming a full circuit that means oxygen can constantly travel around the body whether the animal is breathing in or out. This highly efficient system that puts the rest of us animals to shame has only been noted in one other group, that being birds. This added yet another arrow to the quiver that confirmed the relationship between birds and all other dinosaurs. Sauropods have also pushed our understanding of how ecology worked during the Mesozoic, with their variety in size having the ripple effects that I mentioned earlier, pushing paleontologists to infer and discover way too much for me to go into in one video. But if you do want to find out, why not subscribe to this channel so you can be notified when I upload more amazing facts and discussions, as well as having a classic binge watch of all my previous content. But before you do that, hang around so you can hear me answer today's questions. The first of which comes from jbird8952, who's asked, How come all the megafaunal carnivores in Southern California during the Pleistocene were able to coexist? How was there little to no competitive exclusion going amongst them? What did they do that was different enough to give them different niches? Or were there just so many megafaunal herbivores that it really didn't matter? Okay, so when it comes to megafaunal presence in the late Cenozoic, you have to understand that it comes down to preservational bias. Much of our megafaunal knowledge comes from the La Brea fossil preserves, which I've spoken about here. This area gives us a great insight into the predator reserves that existed alongside the herbivorous fauna, but does give us a skewed vision of the ecology of what was there at the time. The megafaunal carnivores were able to coexist because they were spread out enough with enough separation in their ecological niches. But the areas in which we are able to capture their fossil preservation is limited to where predators make up the majority. Basically, for every one herbivore that comes along and gets trapped in the many tar pits, another 10 to 20 or so predators will come along to feed on the carcass, before getting trapped themselves. Meaning that more predators over time will be preserved for us to find. Again, this doesn't mean that so many more predators existed, just that so many more predators gathered for a free meal in an area that is ideal for preservation. In actuality, a lot more predators would have eaten a much wider array of prey on a much wider plane of hunting grounds. So South California is one of the best examples of preservational bias. Our next question comes from Danilo D'Souza 6461 who has asked, Hello again, Ryan. How have you been? I'm good, thanks. I hope you're well too. So we know flowers evolved in the Cretaceous. Do we know when bees first evolved their behaviours for what we know them for, such as living in eusocial colonies and producing honey? I have more questions, but I'll leave a comment for each of them. Yes, quick side note, I do believe you've taken up the next few slots, but I do need to be fair, so I might do your questions in every other one rather than back to back. Anyway, here goes for the first one. So, pollinating insects such as bees are extraordinarily important for helping plants spread their seed, to the point in which they were literally evolved to do such a task. So where did that come from? Well, we know that bees likely started off in West Gondwana during the early Cretaceous, living in dry xeric shrublands. Once this supercontinent began breaking up, we see a massive diversification with bees that just so happens to coincide with a diversification in flowering plants in South America around 100 million years ago, just as the early Cretaceous was turning into the late Cretaceous. But clearly, other pollinating organisms around the world were already doing their job and it took the end Cretaceous asteroid to thin them out, since we don't see bees in their modern form and behaviour spread across the globe until the warmest episode of the early Cenozoic. Anyway, thank you for submitting those questions, and thank you to everyone else for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, so that I can catch you guys next time.